This is a Defocus Media production. What are your job? What's up, everyone? It's your favorite optometrist, Dr. Daryl Glover. And I'm Dr. Jennifer Lyerly, resident optometry nerd. And welcome to Defocus Media, optometry's number one podcast, where we discuss the hottest topics, latest technology, eyewear, practice management, and more. So sit back, relax, and defocus. Hey, everybody. We are so excited to be joining you this evening. And I know it's a big holiday week for us here in the States. Um, but as crazy as you might be feeling right now and as overwhelmed and stressed as you might be from the frazzle of patient care <laughs> myself right now, it's so important for us to sit back and connect with what makes us passionate about this profession and how much we have to be thankful for. And I'm so excited to introduce our guest this evening because Dr. Joanna Carter we still, did we connect like a month or two ago at this point um, and kind of volunteered to, to share some of her insights and her knowledge and her passion for vision therapy and neurorehabilitative care and optometry and share what she's built with her practice and some of the tips that she has to make it successful in your own. And we've been really looking forward to this conversation for a while. Yeah, thank you. I'm always excited to share about vision therapy and neuro rehab and all the different things that we can do. Um, plus, I think it's important to understand that there is this specialty within optometry and um, just how to refer to each other, but then also how to make a specialty practice successful. Awesome. Well, uh, you know, you've got so much expertise in this profession. You're a member of um, CFED and Tell us a little bit about how you got into vision therapy as a specialty. Ooh, okay. So I guess it's um, it started a long time ago. When I was two and a half, I started um, having an eye turn because I'm one of those one of those rare people that you might remember from optometry school who's actually a hyperope. Um, it's like, like, there's never that many of us in the group. Right. And, uh, so way back when I, you know, I, my, I started crossing, my parents realized there was something wrong. They took me to, I believe an ophthalmologist who gave me glasses and whoop, my eyes were straightened and all was good until I got to optometry school and realized my brain was not talking to both eyes at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really till optometry school that I realized that I had no depth perception. And maybe that's why I always avoided all sports, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> I was a band girl, right? And so, <laughs> um, so then, you know, in, in optometry school, I, too, I also remember that uh, one of the first classes that we took um, at Pacific was behavioral optometry. And I remember First day of class, Dr. Coffee coming in saying, vision is a learned process. And I was just like, what? <laughs> it never even occurred to me before that we at some point in life had to learn to see. So that really stuck with me. But then to be honest, I mean, Pacific University is a big vision therapy school compared to a lot of other schools. Uh, but even still, I felt like, okay, in school we learned the boring stuff, right? I mean, we learned like, what vergences are and how to use an aperture rule. And I mean, nothing that was really that um, earth shattering or, you know, that made me go, oh my gosh, I really have to do this when I grow up. But in my fourth year of optometry school, I did this wonky little. Looks like we're having some internet problems, but you got to love being live here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure <laughs> Dr. Carter will kind of kick back in with us in just yeah, a second. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But while that's taking place, Jen, what's your your um, deal in your practice with vision therapy? Are you doing any of that at all? So personally, I am not. But my partner, Dr. Alicia Barnes, this is something that she's developed a big specialty with. And um you know, did not have any formal training or residency in school. And she first kind of developed a passion for specialty contact lenses. And then just over the past decade of her career has really been interested in vision therapy. And it's gone to a lot of CE and training um, to add that to the practice. And 
Um, so I have a lot of patients, of course, that we diagnosed during the, the standard exam and set her up with a, a VT evaluation. And what I've been surprised to find is so many of my patient referrals are adults. I think many of us yeah. get caught into the idea that VT is for kids. And right. But so many of our patients are adults walking around with undiagnosed, very small vertical heterophorias that are causing them chronic headaches, um, alternating exotropes that have never, you know, known that their two eyes don't work together, but they're getting issues now that they're on the computer for really long hours with end of day eye strain and headaches. Um, and so the headaches is a tip off a lot of times to something more going on. Dr. Carter, we're so glad to have you back. <laughs> I don't remember the last time we had a power outage. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, look, this is live. This is the real deal. This week, you know, it doesn't get any more real than this. I mean, we have times where my son will come in. Uh, luckily, we haven't had times where my wife is yelling at me for something because I don't want her to embarrass me in front of the whole world of eye care. Uh, right. but, you know, this is real life, baby. This is how it goes. So it's all good. But uh, Jen and I, we were just touching on, she does VT in her practice or a business partner does. And okay. um, she was telling me that, you know, um, she has a lot of adult patients. And right. um, a lot of times we do think of VT, we think of kids. I know I do. And um, right. um, I thought that was very interesting. I'm very curious to know, Jen, uh, the adult patients, are they... Um, more compliant than the kids or who who the, who tends to to be more compliant i'd love to get um, an answer from both of you ladies i will say if you have an engaged and interested in an adult they they you're the first person to ever tell them about the problem that they've known their whole life something was not quite right but they never understood what it was they're so motivated to do whatever they can to fix it whereas I, you know we've all had kids in vision therapy where they're like Sometimes there's some emotional stuff going on and, you know, like I'm mad at mom today, so I'm just going to make a little <laughs> for myself. <laughs> it's really hard to do therapy. Right. So you don't have to deal with that with adults, which is nice. <laughs> Not as much. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, well, Dr. Carter, you're the one actually who's seeing these patients, so maybe you have a different feel for it, which one's a little easier to work with. Yeah, well, I mean, it really just depends. In general, in my practice, the majority of the adults that we see are there are in my practice for neuro rehab. And so for them, they're there because they used to function at a certain level and now that and now it's different. And they just want to get back to themselves. They just want themselves back. And for that reason, they are often very motivated. But sometimes they still have lives and children and you know, so in either case, you may have people that come in that go, I wasn't able to get all my stuff done this week. Um, on the other hand, sometimes your neuro patients are too motivated and overdo it. So we have a serious conversation on that first day, which is often reiterated multiple times saying, look, if you try to think you're going to get better by pushing yourself extra hard, you're going to send yourself backwards. And we just need to be really careful not to do that. Yeah. Well, you know, Dr. Carter, I'm glad that you're on the show tonight because when it comes to vision therapy, it's one of those things where I'm just completely lost. I'll just <laughs> be up front. And I'm pretty sure there's a lot of my colleagues out there that have the same mentality or that same mindset. And they're like, okay, let me refer to someone else that can right. take care of this. And, you know, Jen was touching on, you know, specialties and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, for someone like me that may want to learn a little bit more or um, just not familiar with it. I mean, like, I just... I just want to know how I dive into that world, really. I just don't even know where to start. I don't know what to read. I don't know what to do. I'm just so confused when it comes to vision therapy in general. Yeah. I just want to be more educated about it instead of always having to text Jen or call Jen to give me an answer. I mean, like, unless I can start to call you as well, so I don't have to harass well, you. Well, you could. Um, that, that would be totally fine. Um, I think really it, it's, there's sort of two roads to take though. I mean, you're either like all in or you refer out. Mm. And I really, the people that try to just dabble in yeah. vision therapy are the ones that, I'm gonna be honest, just give VT a bad name. They're That's the ones that people go, well, I tried vision therapy and it didn't work. Well, you know, if all you did on the like the the one activity that you did was someone gave you a Brock string and said use it, it's gonna suck. Like it's just not you're not gonna get better because you're not actually learning how to be in charge of your visual system and do things in a new and novel way. Um, and that's what the whole point of vision therapy is. So to really do that, you need 
I mean, it's an intense amount of continuing education or a residency. Now, I didn't do a residency, so I chose the latter. And in my first year out of school, I took a 100 hour course. It was it's a five part course called this. It's the Sanit course. And Bob Sanit hosts it uh, in San Diego uh, every year. And so I went down to San Diego five times in 2006 um, and just like inundated my mind with everything vision therapy. And then I was able to go back to practice and then see my patients and put into play what I was learning. And then two months later, I'd go down and repeat the process and learn more things. Um, so if you really want to do vision therapy, there's a there's a pretty big time um, investment in the learning process. Um, otherwise, you just need to understand like when to refer. Yeah. And yeah. so in those cases, um, those are the patients that I feel like, you know, if they're coming to you and they're having these symptoms and things don't seem to line up, like they're saying things that are just kind of wonky, like, I just don't feel like the road looks straight when I look at it. And you're like, what do I even do with that? <laughs> you know, or please, like if you ever have a patient that's really having any visual complaints post concussion and they not, they're not seeming to get better, like they need someone who has extra expertise in that area to really know how to fine tune the prescription and to look at things like even balance and peripheral vision, but not like Humphrey visual field, but like other things that can really impact um, their overall function. Gotcha. And then kids, it's, I mean, with kids, I just feel like if we are not asking kids if they like to read, like that is, I think the number one question you just see when you have a kid in your chair, just say, Hey, I mean, not when they're four. Right. But you know, if they're, a, you know, early, early to mid elementary age or older, do you like to read? And if the answer is yes, go about your day. And if the answer is no, then there's gotta be a reason. Gotcha. Right. So and it might not be visual, but at least like take a look at a couple of things. Take a look at, okay, like everybody's going to check pursuits, right? Or they're going to check to see EOMs. Well, if they're, you know, if their head has to move to follow the target and you're like, okay, now let's try it like a statue. And they're like, okay, and they cannot, they cannot keep their head still. That's developmentally low or just at least pull out, you know, a target for them to see if they can converge upon it. And just a couple of tests like that give you at least a, just a preliminary idea of how well are their eyes and brain working together. And if they're not, refer them out. Awesome. So I, I really want to unpack this. And I think this is great because Jen has some experience with this and I'm a novice with this. I'm going to take the referral route, you know, but being that I'm going to take that referral route, um, I want to know what type of communication or dialogue I need to have with that patient. Um, whether it's the parent, uh, whether it is the parent that is the patient, and what I should do when it comes to their frame and lens benefit. Should I utilize that? Because, you know, we're trying to get that uh, glasses and keep them held to the practice. Or is it right. really doing you guys a disservice when I refer them over to you and you need to get them a pair of glasses and add prism in them and then something's already done and the benefits used and you got to remake the glasses. I mean, there's so many different pieces and layers to this. Let's right. just start with, you know, the right dialogue and conversation I should have with that patient and tell them what they expect when they see you. And then also that piece in regards to eyewear, lens, material benefits and how that plays out on both ends. And that, that is an excellent question. So just a couple of things about sort of how I built my practice, if I can just add that part yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I specifically designed my office to not have an optical. And it was specifically for that reason, because I didn't want that to be a deterrent to referrals. So I have, you know, set my this office aside as a specialty practice. It's a referral practice. Like, I really don't do any primary care. I mean, a couple people because I was an OD for 10 years before I opened this office. So I have a few people that are like, you will be my doctor. <laughs> you know, but, <laughs> But not that many because I don't take insurance anymore, right? So <laughs> fine, I don't, I don't want to be a primary care doctor. So it works out. Um, but in general, um, if I had my perfect way, the patients would not get their prescription filled until they see me. Okay. And it is a challenge when you have someone come in and you're like, dang, I would not have prescribed that. Um, and so then you have to have that awkward conversation. Well, I'm seeing this, like in my brain, I'm thinking, is it enough of a change to warrant 
having to do that conversation with the referring doctor? Um, and sometimes the answer is yes. Um, <laughs> more so, honestly, when it's an ophthalmology referral, because they like to go big. And I'm like, ah, like giving them six diopters of base in prism in each eye, not going to be helpful. Um, so we need, ah, let's tone that down. Um, so sometimes that's the case. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, ultimately, I, I would prefer it if I could be the one to write that prescription because I am coming at, at it from more of that behavioral and developmental perspective. Um, for our neuro patients, too, I'm going to use usually a much smaller prescription than what people think of because they have a very low tolerance for everything. Um, so, you know, I want to be, I want to be careful for that. In terms of what to say with the patient, well, you have to have some idea of why you're referring them, just like any other specialty. I mean, you're not going to refer to an ophthalmologist unless you have a reason, right? Right. So you're going to say, oh, it looks, uh, the, the very, very basic level, you could say, hey, it just looks like your eyes aren't teaming together or your eyes aren't tracking well together. And I have a specialist that can teach you how to do that properly so you're not having to work so hard. And so I want you to see her so that you can, so that we can get this um, properly diagnosed and, you know, and go through the therapy pro process to, to work on it. Um, so you're gonna have some idea of, you know, you're not just gonna say, do you like to read? And they say no, and you say, okay, go see Dr. Carter. <laughs> no, I mean, you're going to find out why, or at least, ha again, have some idea. I'm not asking you to do the full 21 point exam and get all those vergence ranges and the worth four dot and all that stuff that you're like, I haven't done that like ever. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but don't worry, I do that. And <laughs> but still just, you know, you're going to have some reason. Usually I'm getting people that are like, OK, well, they have high esophoria or they have convergence insufficiency. They've got a basic idea of like something's not right in the system that's causing this kid or this you know patient to have trouble go see dr carter i for like and obviously there's so many different ways of doing this but actually since i have a chance to pick your brain what i found in my quick and dirty sort of part of my routine exam i'm doing of course a some sort of eom muscle evaluation um a cover test and an inner ipra and between those three things, I feel like I'm going to catch most of the issues. But I will say I had a few years in there where I had a few patients that they were all clean on all that stuff, but they were not good readers. And I was not asking an essential question, which was about, um, are they having trouble with reversals or letter recognition? And I missed so many visual perception and visual discrimination patients that could right. have benefited. And so now I add that as a question that I ask everybody too. <laughs> okay, yeah, and I mean, that's great. Um, I have brochures that I give to different people too. And in the middle of the brochure is just a, a symptom list. And so that I think is helpful too, if, you're, if you are referring to somebody and you have something like that and the parents can go, well, that's my kid, that's my kid, that's my kid. You know, it just kind of validates like, oh my gosh, this really is the right place to go. Yeah, I mean, and what's the basic stuff that I should be doing through the, my primary care exam? I mean, I know Jen touched on EOMs, cover tests. I mean, that's some of the basic things that I do. But like, what test should I be doing for every patient that walks through the door? And what are maybe the top five symptoms of things that I should look for? So when I have these people in my chair, I'm able to refer them to, you know, a Dr. Lyerly, a Dr. Carter to be able to really accommodate the problems that they have. Right. Well, I, I would say if you are not only doing EOMs, but watching how that they are doing them, and if you are doing cover tests at distance and near, you are already like leaps and bounds ahead of a lot of a lot of ODs out there, to be honest. Um, and so that that is fantastic already. But I would definitely throw in a near point of convergence. Um, and especially with our um, concussion patients or head trauma patients, Oh my gosh, like they might be able to converge to a certain level, but they are gonna look like this. They're gonna be like, <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, if anybody is like physically revolting from the oh. thought of something come to the close to their face, that is not okay. And what <laughs> are like the matrix? They're gonna work you know? on a computer all day, they're not gonna feel good. Is that the matrix effect? Is that what you call it when they're there? People just, whoa. <laughs> I you literally know had someone today where we were doing, so I do also a chair side saccade where I've got two different, two different colored wands and I just say, okay, when I say silver, you're going to look at the silver. And then when I say gold, you're going to look at the gold. And then I just, you know, check back and forth. And then at the end of that, I go like this 
And then my patient today too, she went, <laughs> I'm like, honey, I'm not going to hit you with it. It's okay. You know what but, I think people are going wrong is they, you guys, be honest, are you having your techs do EOMs and cover tests? If you are, you guys, they, you're missing they a lot of information. <laughs> Yeah. All right, you're every person's ortho, everyone's full EOMs. I guarantee you. So don't think your techs, no matter how good you are at training them, if they did not go through optometry school, they are not going to be able to do EOMs and cover tests in a legitimate way. I agree. That I is agree. also yeah. That's that's really critical too. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your setup. I mean, I see all types of cool toys and uh, things in the background there. I would love to learn a little bit more about, you know, what actually happens when a patient comes to see Dr. Carter. I know it depends on the actual uh, problem that uh, the patient was referred for, but right. it just looks like a lot of cool things there that I know if I take my son there, he would have a ball. So uh, please, please yeah. tell us and please share. Yeah. Well, and I moved some extra things in. So we're in um, our smaller vision therapy room right now uh, when we just renamed all the rooms in the office. So this is the brain room. Uh, the bigger vision therapy room is our movement room. Uh, and then my exam room is the eyes room. So eyes, brain, and body. But we thought body room sounded a little weird, so we called it movement. Um, <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so you know, I, I get a lot of people, of course, that come in that have been referred by another eye doctor. So they just had an eye exam and the kid's sitting in the chair going, why am I here? Like, I'm pretty sure I just did this. And I always assure them, I say, hey, you know, some of the things we're going to do today are things you're familiar with, and some of them you've never done before. So I promise you we're going to be doing some brand new things. And for the most part, the new things are the fun things. Yeah. They're like, okay. You know, <laughs> uh, so I did bring some of my equipment that I use in my exam, sort of my like stuff I can't live without. Okay. And, um, so my wolf wands, these are, these are just... I use them all the time. These are for my like mid elementary and older patients is what I'm gonna use these for. Um, so again, I'm gonna use these for EOMs. I'm gonna check saccades. I'm gonna check NPC with these. Um, if something's not right in my, like in, in what I'm thinking, I might also do what's called a red lens NPC where I just use a light and a red lens and I see how far in can they converge without with a non-accommodative target. So. Um, and then for my younger kiddos, I'm going to show you my most important tool for my younger kiddos. Are you ready? I'm ready. Yeah. It's finger puppets. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So, and you can do the same thing. You can, you can do peripheral vision tests. Okay. Watch the kitty and tell me when the doggy's there. You can do saccades and you can do EOMs, all the things with the dog and the tiger. Okay. So that's really cool. Um, I love a good stereo test and this one I got a couple years ago and I, it's got your random dot butterfly, which is way less scary than the fly. Can you, can people just stop using that fly? I hate that thing. Um, but I like the fact that it's random dot also, um, because it just, in general, our isotropes tend to have a harder time with random dot, but then when you get them to where they can see it, then it's like this massive celebration. Um, and then on the other side, um, these are just the word circles but it goes all the way down to 20 arc seconds, which I think is really cool because, you know, just assuming that 40 is normal, well, maybe we could get even better than that. So um, now, this is also one of my favorites and I got these from Good Light. Um, and these are like awesome, awesome trial lens holders uh, because I do a ton of trial lens framing um, for, kids, but it's, again, especially my neuro rehab patients. The thing I like about this is that you can um, sort of twist where this well goes in. So you yeah. can do ba prisms of any base direction in here. And then there's two additional wells. So you can do sphere and cylinder and prism. Um, so these are great. I have, especially my neuro, again, my neuro patients, I'm gonna have them try them on. I'm gonna have them look around, see how it feels. Like, do we feel dizzy with them on? Because we shouldn't. Um, if they come in with dizziness, I'm checking to see if my prescription dampening that because we can with the right lenses. Um, and then most of the time, especially with my neuro patients, again, I'm going to have them walking up and down the hallway and even sometimes walking out front um, and outside to look down the street to watch the cars moving at them and just, just to real, get a real life feel of how the lenses are working for them. Gotcha. I love those trial frames i think about all the times i'm trying to trial frame prism and the prism's like shoving into the nose that's amazing i've never seen yes. that before. 
Yeah, and so they come in different sizes. So, and I just bought two of them. I got this one's a sixty-two, and then I have a fifty-eight. Um, and between those two, they're pretty. I mean, I'm I'm okay if the PD's off by one. You know, like it gives it, it's it's a good enough range for most of the people. And then the final piece, again for neuro rehab, is this loveliness, which is just a bunch of different lenses, um, or I, I guess um, like filters. Like this is a twenty percent FL forty one. Um, this is a 5% FL41, um, just different tints and stuff that we can do. I have blue tech in here, um, which is really nice blue blocker um, that my neuro patients, usually they're going to love either FL41 or the blue tech. I, I know a lot of my colleagues also use like a purple, um, like an omega type um, tint as well. I just don't have any of those. Um, but also in here, I've got um, some low yoked prisms. So these are, uh, I guess it's upside down, uh, but <laughs> one, one base down OU and a half base down OU. And then finally, I've got some just really low powered base in. So this is a half base in. Uh, so and these are just my go-to lenses that I'm, I'm using uh, particularly for neuro rehab. So Doctor, would you mind sharing oh, sorry, how you um, got your, were those like custom made? Uh, that they you were, yes. And they th that all came about via a conversation with a good friend of mine. Uh, she's my mentor, Gabby, Ma Gabby Marshall. Uh, she practices in Central Oregon. And she called me one day and she was like, hey, blah, blah, blah. By the way, I'm putting in this order for these, you know, for these lenses. So she, she does have an optical in her office. And she was um, ordering some and I said, double it. I'll pay you back. <laughs> so that, that's how that came about. So again, I don't have a lab that I use. So if I do need to get stuff like that, uh, I have to kind of, hey, <laughs> hey, friend. <laughs> well, one thing I wanted to say, oh, oh, sorry, Jen. I was going to say, one thing I wanted to say earlier is that I can clearly see you're passionate about this. Just the energy, the the vibes I'm getting today, this evening, I'm just I'm I'm overwhelmed overwhelmed with joy because for me I always worry when I refer my patient out for VT you know like I, I don't really know a lot of my optometrist colleagues that I'm referring to and I just hope that when I refer them that especially with the kids that they have the energy that's going to keep that kid's attention and that they're going to feel comfortable in that setting and not come back next year and say Dr. Glover why'd you send me there I don't understand what happened and they never want to go back because right. we all know if kids don't buy in they're not going to do what they're supposed to do. So I'm just, I, I love the energy. I love your personality. I know having a VT appointment with you is probably the the the, the probably the funnest exam ever uh, <laughs> known to mankind when it comes to optometry, but I just love the energy. I don't know, you might get, you, you might change your mind once we get to those virgins ranges. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Yeah, you know, when I make you see double on purpose, you might be like, wait a minute, <laughs> I thought this was supposed to be fun. <laughs> the other piece I was going to ask you about, because this is like a real pain in the butt for me, is when you have that low prism, I love how you had the mark, you know, which was down and with the, the different uh, sides, because I don't know about you, Jed, but when I'm like one or two, I'm like, is this the right way or is it this way? So I'm like... <laughs> Um, yeah, do you know, I do a ton of point five. Yeah, <laughs> and so sometimes I'm like, I hold up to my I'm like, oh, this is okay, good. <laughs> yeah, you are not alone. <laughs> I but I like how you marked it, so yeah. I, know, I may have to do that next time on my because I have the loose lens, you know, that comes with the lens yeah. uh, trial kit. So I don't have all the bells and whistles of the the ones that you have, but maybe I need to invest in that and make life a lot easier, right? And it was just last year that I learned about a kit. Then this would be like, you wouldn't need this um, per se, unless you're doing a lot of prism stuff. But there's a kit that you can buy that actually um, starts in quarter diopter, quarter prism. It's quarter, half, three quarter, one. And then it goes in half and then one diopter increments until like 20. And I, I mean, I've been practicing for 15 years. And for 14 of those years, I was only using those six prisms that come in the trial lens set. Right. And it's like impossible. If you have someone that requires more than that, then it's like trying to layer stuff on top of other things. And this trial lens set was fantastic. I think I got it from Brunel. And it was probably an investment, like a couple mm -hmm. hundred bucks. But it's so great. Right. <laughs> well, you know, prism is an interesting topic, right? I know Jen prescribes a lot of prism for... Uh, computer glasses and helping people. And recently, within the last couple of months, we had a, um, a company on that 
uh, touches on uh, prism in their glasses where they're able to have it uh, be different at distance as well as near. Um, what are you doing when you have patients that have uh, a need for different different prism in uh, different zones? I mean, what, what products are you using? What technology are you using? What advice do you have? Well, I, were you talking about the NeuroLens? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm familiar with that. I'm also familiar with the price tag associated with it. And again, because I don't have an optical, I sort of talked to them briefly about that at a, I think it was at a neuro um, optometry meeting last year and was like, ah, I'm not quite ready to invest in that. Typically, if we need different prism for distance than near, I'm just prescribing multiple pair of glasses. Um, and again, because I do a lot of neuro rehab, most of those patients don't tolerate progressives anyway, at least acutely. Um, so mo a lot of times I'm just like step one is to take people out of their progressives until their system stabilizes and then get them back into them again. And then by then we might not need as much prism or it might not be variable anyway. So I don't have any like a super fancy answer. That's that's sort of my go to. Let's talk about your uh, equipment that you're using for treatment, because I can see you've got quite a few things on the back wall there, too. Right. So, um, you know, when I when I started doing vision therapy, um, I guess, again, so I started out when I was first out of school and then I took a five year break while I was making babies. So I just worked at a Sears optical and I did no vision therapy. It was it was wonderful and also like the hardest practice decision I ever made. So then eventually I got back into doing VT and I was I I built it within a private practice that I had joined. Um, but the challenge there was that, that was my passion and it wasn't the owner's passion. So it was I mean, we were happy to, that I was doing it, but I wasn't really able to invest a lot of money at all into the equipment like I could get the bare like the bare bones. And, and that was it. So when I chose to say, hey, I this is all I want to be when I grow up. This is what I want to do. This is the specialty that I want. There were a couple of things that I purchased on the get go that were so incredibly exciting for me. And one of those was my like for like $30 pitch back net back there. <laughs> wow. That's when I brought it in. I was like, I didn't expect I that. So, I was so excited to buy that thing and it wasn't even that expensive, but it was like, it was, it was my, choice now, right? You're like, my thing. Um, so, you know, anything that we can do that is interactive and gives patients awareness of, of space and their surroundings and their peripheral vision, like all that's going to help integrate that ability to use the eyes, brain, and body better together. So that's um, that's what the pitch back net is for. Um, behind me over here, I have what's called a space fixator. This is the fancy one. I had like a homemade version for a while, um, which was just a big piece of plexiglass with dots on it. But this one actually has a stand, um, another, you know, decent investment. But that one, it just allows us to be able to localize exactly where it is in space. Um, and then there's like sequenced movements that you do with it and you can load it up and add a metronome and all the things to make it more cognitively interactive. Um, I'm a big fan of free space stuff. So I do, I have very little technology type things in my office. Like my favorite vision therapy um, tools are, again, finger puppet. This is, <laughs> everybody gets a finger puppet and it's like a finger puppet monster. And I tell, like, I have a 90 year old patient that did some VT with me. And I was like, I don't care how old you are. You're getting a finger puppet. You can name them if you want to, okay? Um, I love these translucent, uh, yeah, these uh, translucent patches that you can get from Burnell, um, and there's different different kinds that you can get from different places. But I, it, we do very little patchwork in my office. But when we do, I want to be able to see what that eye is doing. So it's really important for me that I can see through it, but they they can't. Um, mm -hmm. So that's really helpful. Um, bean bags from Amazon. Make your own Marsden ball. These are the ones we send home. We did buy a couple of fancy ones for, you know, to hang up in the office. Um, bigger ticket items, um, still free space. These are some nice yoked prism goggles um, from either Brunel or uh, Good Light. I don't remember which one they came from. Um, you can get different prism powers. And then that, again, is going to help to change their perception of where things are in space. Um, and then you can work on work walking on a balance beam or again doing like pitch back net and stuff um 
Vectograms, again, bigger ticket item um, because they're like 180 bucks for this. Who knew? Uh, but they're really awesome to like really help people to start to understand where things are in space and how to see in 3D. Mm -hmm. That being said, I do have like two pieces that are electronic <laughs> in my office. Uh, one of them is a saccadic fixator. I got the Benovi, um, which is that touch dot button one. That's in the other room. I'm not gonna take you in there. Um, and then one we use sometimes. Um, I find that that's really helpful, especially for our patients that are more sporty or um, like competitive. Um, so, you know, that could be helpful. Um, and we can use red green glasses and, and do different things with that one. And then um, it's turned off right now, but I, I did invest in Vivid Vision, which is a virtual reality mm -hmm. system. Um, and I got that a couple of years ago. Um, I'm a big fan. I think it is helpful to create a situation for our patients to maybe see in 3D for the first time, and then ultimately to transfer that into real space. Like, I don't just want people to be really good in 3D in virtual land, but I ultimately want them to have 3D vision in the real world as well. But it's, it is, a, um, it, I, I feel like it's a nice piece of technology that helps us in a novel way. Sometimes people are like, it's weird to say, but sometimes I think people are scared to see in 3D. Like it's something they've never done and they don't know how and they're, there's just a sort of like a fear factor about that. So if you give them something that's like, sort of real and tangible, they're like, no, I'm not going to see that. But if you put them in a headset in a world that's totally novel, then they, it's almost like they're willing to experience it. That's awesome. I, that's a fascinating concept of it. Daryl, have you ever put on the Vivid Vision? I have not. I have it's not. pretty cool. I, I've only done the one simulation where it's like you're picking like apples and fruit like off right. a tree, but it's, it's trippy. And so I can totally see like how immersive <laughs> that would be if you've never seen 3D before and be like, oh, it's like, it's, it, it feels very realistic. <laughs> right. That's a really high level game too. That's like one of their highest ones where you're really experiencing that depth. And sometimes people aren't ready for that. The thing I like about it is that you, um, there's a, there's a game called breaker, which is like a ping pong type game or like a hit the ball with a paddle. Um, and one eye sees the paddle and the other eye sees the ball. So it's, it's a nice way to, um, just help that brain to integrate both eyes, turn both eyes on at the same time in a safe way. Mm -hmm. And then you we can play with questions. things like how how much each eye is seeing and that kind of stuff too. We had a, a question from LinkedIn I'm gonna put up on this to pick your brand. So Sierra wants to know uh, about syntonics and um, if you're using that in your practice and, and what is it? That is an excellent question. And I do, I actually have my, oh, my syntonizer right there. It's a super old looking machine that I bought two years ago, brand new. Uh, so, Yes, uh, Syntonics is a big part of my practice now and is probably the number one um, treatment technique that I dug my heels in and swore I'd never do um, because it sounds woo-woo. <laughs> Not yeah. only does it sound woo-woo, but the machine looks woo-woo too. I mean, what right, is going on with right. that thing? I mean, like, oh, you're using colored light to change the eyes. Okay. <laughs> And I was like, mm -mm, no, I'm not going to do that. Like that sounds uh, too much like some other treatments that I don't really feel are real. Um, but after a while, I started getting colleague after colleagues, you know, kind of talking in my ear about, well, I did this with syntonics and I was like, eh, you know, and then I, it, after a while, I, was, I couldn't ignore it anymore. So then I, 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 I watched a course by Rob Fox, uh, who practices in New York. And it was really interesting and informative. And then I took his course in Colorado a couple of years ago, and uh, and decided, okay, now I want to I want to start incorporating this into my practice. So syntonics is the use of um, colored lenses to affect the autonomic nervous system, and we use it through the eyes, through the visual system. And and I feel like the best way, the, the way it makes the most sense to me is if we talk about a patient who's had a concussion. So your concussion patients are often going to be like super amped up right after the concussion. Like they're just, they're high anxiety, their, their nerves are, are, are triggered easily. Um, they have a short fuse for all the things, right? Um, and, and visually, 
they're the ones that'll jump back on convergence. Like their eyes are, they're in go mode. They're like, blah, run. Right. So like they're being chased by a dinosaur. Like they're just, blah. And, and so, and, and that's because the sympathetic nervous system is like way on high alert. And I, you know, I like to say it's, it's really good to have a sympathetic nervous system, but I don't want to live there. So, <laughs> and, and that's where they are living and why everything is so challenging. Right. So we will use, and these patients will use colors on the cool side of the color spectrum, the greens and the blues, sometimes the purples, depending on what's going on, to help like, <sighs> like simmer down that sympathetic overload. And what we find is that by doing that, these patients are able to kind of like breathe better. They're able to, um, they're able to converge again. Like that's not the be all end all treatment for most patients, but sometimes it is. Like that's all they needed. And they're like, ha, ah, now I'm a human again. And then they taper off the, the treatment and they're done. Uh, but sometimes that's just a piece of the treatment that allows us to then start making changes to the system as a whole. I, I actually was scared when we first went I was like, oh my gosh, she's gonna like tell me that syntonics is crazy talk. Because story, about a year ago, <laughs> um, my partner <laughs> told me, she's like, Jen, I need you to write on our website, um, a summary of syntonix. And I had, no, I mean, I don't do vision therapy. I refer to her for vision therapy. And I, right. I told her, I was like, I've never heard of this thing, but okay. So I started researching and I was like, what is this? Because of course like, the first article I read was like, oh, well, when you have a burn, if you put a blue light on it, the burn heals. And I was like, Sounds, I can't write an article on our website about this. But then she, do, she helped me with a few other things. And it made so much more sense to me and with what you just described makes excellent sense and talking about i guess the best way we've kind of talked about it in our practice for patients who start reading some kind of wacky articles on the internet that paint this in a, a wrong light is um seasonal affective disorder and how you treat it it is a, this is an established medical treatment that we've all heard about and using that blue based light to improve mood and, and our cycles and our, our nervous systems reaction and treat the symptoms of seasonal affective disorder. So we know that how our body processes different wavelengths and frequencies of light can affect our, our neurons and our nervous system in a certain way. And treating that specific mood disorder is not so strange to believe. It could also treat nervous system disorders around the eye and brain that we're, our, our patients in vision therapy are dealing with. Um, and it's been fascinating to see how she's utilizing this technology and the major responses some patients have to it. like certain colors on certain patients they the way that it affects them almost physically afterwards is a surprise i still am, am i think it's something that we need a lot more science to understand fully what's happening but it really makes a difference for people and y'all are doing like the research basically right now on it and how to utilize it in your practice which is great right yeah, I, I, I've been very pleased, and the more I, the more I learn about it, the more I realize there is so much to learn about it. So that's that's really like the next thing on my docket of like what's the next big thing I want to you know invest my time and energy in learning about, and, and it really is because I've I've just taken that first course, and you know, and, and I remember Dr. Fox saying you know eighty five percent of your patients are going to fall into these categories. And I don't know if in Medford, Oregon, we just are have skewed stats, but I feel like I have a, quite a few patients that don't fall into those exact categories. So then I'm reaching out to my gurus saying, help, you know, I've got this person that ah, I tried this thing. And, you know, um, so it's, you know, obviously I'm really thankful for the people that will help me out in these situations where I'm like, this one doesn't fit the rules. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you have a lot of cool tools back there and you're really changing lives. Uh, but, you know, those folks out there that may want to jump into this world of VT and be able to help these patients. One thing that they're always concerned about is profit, making money, being able to take care of the bills, insurance. Um, what are you doing with insurance? Do you accept insurance? Do you not accept insurance? Um, you know, how do we make a practice like this profitable? Um, let's talk about more of that money piece, the financial piece of uh, VT, if you don't mind. I don't mind. And I, that's very important. Um, when I was in the process of 
like forming the ideas of this practice. Like I knew it was going to happen, but I hadn't told my colleagues yet that I was leaving the practice I was at or whatnot. You know, I, I was at a CE meeting and afterwards a few people were milling around and uh, I had, they were grumbling about insurance. And I just walked up and I said, well, you know, in my in my perfect world, I would be in a practice that doesn't take any insurances. And they were all like, yeah, right. <laughs> and I'm like, but it will. <laughs> you know, and then a few months later, I opened my doors. And um, yeah, so from the get go, we have been out of network with all insurance. Um, wow. and it, so and it was easy to do because most insurance doesn't cover vision therapy. So it happens to be a specialty that is not recognized by insurance companies. And whether that's good or whether that's bad is a different conversation. Um, but it's either not reimbursed at all, like it, it's it's an exclusion on the policy, or it's reimbursed by such a phenomenally low rate that there's no way that you could make a living by accepting some of these insurances. Um, so out of network. In my practice, what that means is we, um, we do not like bill the insurance and then collect afterwards from the patient. And we're not in contract with anybody at this point. However, we do courtesy bill on our patient's behalf. So the patients pay up front for their services and then we do submit the claim through Office Ally um, for them. And if they, the insurance then pays us, then we reimburse the patient. So it is some work on the back end, but I feel like that helps sort of get people in the door even though they have to pay out of pocket. So just knowing that we're doing a little bit of the work for them, I think is helpful. And now that means, oh, go ahead. So Medicare and Medicaid do not allow for out-of-network billing. So we have to have those patients sign a form saying, we understand that this is out-of-pocket and we can't submit for reimbursement. So I almost think it makes it easier because you just, you don't take any. So it, to me, when you are, you are on insurance plans, okay, and you're seeing them for your primary care and like, oh, I take your Blue Cross Blue Shield, but then they, they, you recommend therapy and you start therapy and like, oh, well, I take Blue Cross Blue Shield, but your insurance won't pay for this. It's kind of like, oh, well, is this not a real treatment? Because my insurance paid for everything else you wanted me to do, but they won't pay for this treatment that you said that I need. So it, they, it like plans that question in the patient's head, like you take my insurance, but they don't pay for this. So is this legitimate? If you just don't take any insurance, it's like that question never enters their mind because they're going to find some ridiculous ophthalmology colleague that's going to say, oh, that's a bunch of crap, you know, right. and feed into that opinion that that first planted in their head because of the insurance issue. Right. Yeah. And people ask all the time, well, you know, why doesn't my insurance cover this? And I just say, you know what? It's actually mostly political, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh. That's <laughs> but a great response. It is. I'm, like, I'm going to take that one. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true, though, because that is what it is. It is. And that sort of takes like that medical validity out of it. Like there's people with a lot of money that just don't want that service to be covered. Um, so, I mean, it depends on who I'm talking to, if I'm going to say that, of course. Um, so that being said, I've actually made, in the last couple months, I have made a couple of big shift decisions in my practice. And um, one of them is, is we've been seeing quite a few workers comp patients. And so we, I did fill out the paperwork to be contracted with one of the workers comp companies, Majoris, um, only because it's such a pain to try to get them into my office. And the doctor that is running the workers comp clinic totally gets what we do. And so she keeps trying to send patients to me and they keep getting denied getting to see me because I'm not in network. Mm -hmm. So, and workers comp, comp pays pretty well. So I'm, and, and they pay for the vision therapy once they get the ball rolling. So I'm like, why would I not do that? So, but they made this new rule that said, oh, well, because of COVID, you have to be able to do telehealth which is no problem because when March hit, we decided let's revamp our system and we got up and running to be able to do telehealth vision therapy. Oh, but you have to be able to do telehealth with new patients as well. Well, optometry law in Oregon prevents that. Uh, so, so it basically excludes optometry then. Correct. Yeah. So I, I wrote a very passionate letter uh, and I'm still waiting to hear back. So we'll see what happens there. And then the other insurance that I just filled out the paperwork last week and apparently missed a bunch of stuff because I have a lot more to do was <laughs> getting back on Medicare. 
And that was a huge shock to me because I was like, nope, never going to be on Medicare because they don't pay for vision therapy anyway. Um, but the fact is I've been seeing a lot more stroke patients with vision issues or visual processing issues related to the stroke. So not just a visual field cut, but other things going on along with it. Um, and we're making huge gains in these patients, like getting them to read again and, and you know, helping their balance and all this stuff. And I mean, at least if I can bill them for the office visits and that initial exam, I mean, that that would be huge. Um, and then also there, there was one optometrist in our little valley that had hospital privileges and he just retired. So now no optometrists are going into the hospitals for any of the neuro rehab care. But of course, if you're gonna do that, you gotta be on Medicare because those are gonna be, you know. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna bite the bullet. And uh, so anyway, so th that's still in the works. The so biggest great insight is, though. I yeah. wouldn't be able to say we're out of network with all insurance. We'll have to yeah. add yeah. except for Medicare. <laughs> you know, it, it seems like you know this this can really be financially rewarding especially when you have to see a patient multiple times but my my million dollar question and i'm pre pretty sure everyone else is wondering is how many patients do you have to see a day to make this you know um uh, worth whatever you, wh what you're doing i mean like do you have to see four five six ten patients i mean how long do these uh sessions take and how many do you have to see a day so this is the, the answer is twofold. Um, first and foremost, um, another reason why I'm out of network with insurance is because I don't want an insurance company dictating how long I can spend with my patient by how much they can reimburse me. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to me to spend that time with the patients. I mean, sometimes I'm spending a half an hour just to get the history mm -hmm. because it's important. Um, so my new patient evals are 75 minutes long. Sometimes they don't take that long. Sometimes I wish I had more time with them. Um, some, and neuro patients usually have to come in twice for like the 75 minute and then another hour long appointment um, to really get all the information that I need that's going on. So with that in mind, my typical day, like a busy day, six patients. Mm -hmm. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> crazy. I mean, I just, I mean, you know, 75 minutes for one patient. I don't know what, like that's, that's a long time, but yes. I'm not doing all the detailed stuff that you're doing. I mean, mainly I'm running my mouth, having a good time, but also, you know, getting them squared away, checking ocular health, practicing full scope optometry, but right. whew, 75 minutes, that's a long time. But you know, you know if, if these patients were in your chair, these are the patients that come in and you're like, oh my gosh, my day is so messed up now because you're <laughs> on your, your tight schedule. And this person, can, they cannot do a refraction in, yeah. in a 20 minute exam slot, let alone the rest of the exam. So right. these are the patients that, you know, they need to be referred to someone who can spend that time with them because they cannot, they cannot be within the, the, the 20 minute exam slot you know, primary care optometry clinic. Right. Yeah. But, okay, so then how do we make it profitable? Well, number one, we're not going to take insurance. So again, we're going to be able to charge enough to make it make sense to spend that much time with the patient. But simultaneously, I have vision therapists. And that's how it works. That's how we make money in vision therapy is that I can be seeing patients while my therapists are seeing patients at the same time. Gotcha. So... And for me, that was like the big moment. Um, before I opened this office, about a year ahead of time, I hired my first vision therapist and trained him. And it was like, I felt like I had made it, you know? <laughs> it's like, this is big time. Because now it's not the doctor that's doing the therapy anymore. And so that allows us to be able to, to invest more in the practice. Because then you're bringing in more so that you can invest more. And then people know, you know, it's like, it's, it's all good things. Uh, so now, I mean, I don't have that big of an office. We're just a, you know, a three room clinic, uh, but I have two vision therapists and one front desk person and myself. And, um, you know, and, and that, and that's actually perfect. But, uh, <laughs> so that, typical I mean, hours? If you're profitable, that's, that's how you do it. What's your typical hours? I mean, with this freedom of being able to dictate how much you're going to get per patient, are you seeing people Monday through Saturday or is it a Monday through Thursday schedule? I mean, like what, what's your typical week like? That was, that was probably my biggest hold up 
like personal holdup in, in opening my own practice. And I remember being at a COVD meeting um, in 2016, and I was talking outside of the hospitality suite with some optometry gurus. And Brenda Montecalvo said, well, you just need to open your own practice. And this is how you're going to do it. And she laid it all out for me. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I think I'm going to open my own practice now. And I said, wait, no, 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 I can't because I have kids, you know, like we've got family and we've got sports. And she said, honey, you're the specialist. You set your own hours. They'll come to you. So we are open from 830 until 430, Monday through Thursday. So you guys, this is what we're talking about. It's a vision (laughs) therapy practice. You have to be open late. And my answer to that is, number one, well, except for tonight, I want to get home to my family. (laughs) And they, even though vision therapy is important and I'm passionate about it, my family is a higher level priority than my than my job. So I, I still want to be, and for myself and for my staff, I want them to be able to get home at a decent hour. But then number two, I don't want to be seeing patients when they're wiped out at the end of the day. I'm like, do you really think I'm going to be able to change your son's brain at 6 p.m.? And they're like, no. Makes sense. Okay. Good point. Yeah. Well, I know you do have a family to get back to, and we've taken an hour of your precious time so much. But, I mean, I this conversation could go for more and more time. I think <laughs> if we had three hours, we would find a way to fill it for sure because there's so much passion that you have for this and so much great stuff that you're providing and inspiring other people with. So I know people are going to have questions. I want to learn more from you. Would you mind sharing some contact information in case someone wants to learn out or reach out and, and contact you as a mentor? Sure. Um, and I do want to mention that you know, a few years ago, I did start a Facebook group for people who wanted to that either do vision therapy or want to learn more about it. Um, so, Daryl, that would be a good opportunity for you if you just wanted to, like, dip your finger in, like, what's happening in vision therapy land? Or if that's too scary, you don't have to. It's fine. Well, so um, I, want to, I want to know what's going on, because, I, you know, when you're talking to a patient, they're coming to you because you're the expert. And if I'm going to pass someone over to someone else. I want to be able to communicate exactly or have a good overview of what they're going to get themselves into because they're coming to me because they feel like I am the expert in their community to help them with their eye care. And if I can't do it, I need to at least have a good understanding of what you're going to do once I put that patient in your hands, you know? So so the group on Facebook is VTODs on Facebook. And to you, Daryl, I would say it is really important for me when I'm referring for anything, I want to, to the best of my ability, personally know that person that I'm referring to. And I, I mean, if you haven't already, you should get together in person, virtually, whatever, with your VT providers, like get to know them personally. And you might find that, oh, you know what, like, I think I think I really like how this person approaches things or discusses things or whatever. Like this would be the my my go to referral person in my area. Um, And you could always ask me, too, because I, you know, I I don't know a lot of VT docs. Um, So, (laughs) you know, it might be helpful in that realm as well. Uh, Yeah, my I mean, I'm happy to respond if people have specific questions via email. Um, I can I put my email in the chat. Would that be helpful? Yeah, sure. Why not? Okay. And then we'll also um, be able to uh, put it on the companion post to go along with this as well. Um, so, yeah, we can definitely have people reach out to you. I'm actually going to uh, create it so that everyone can see it. And um, they can oh, reach yep, out to you. <laughs> you know, if I get overloaded with questions, I'm blaming you. Um, you know, on, the, on the VTODs Facebook page too, there is a, an option to do a mentorship, and we, there's several people that have signed up that say, "Hey, if you want a mentor, I'll I'll be happy to help out." And so it kind of helps link people up together. Um, just you know, if you're and and it can be about anything. It could be about building a practice, or it could be about incorporating VT in primary care, or I want to learn more about strabismus, whatever. Like, so you can you can be more specific too about what you're looking for in a mentor. Well, awesome. Thank you so so much again with your generosity on this. And I know we'll have you back on because this is a topic that has a lot more to discuss. So um, we can't wait to check back in with you. Have a wonderful holiday. All right, you guys too. Thank you so much. See you. Thank you again. All right, colleagues, and it's a wrap. Thank you dearly for hanging out with the Defocus Media team. 
We hope truly something resonated with you. And if it did, be sure to give us five stars and make sure you follow us on all social media platforms. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, you named it. And our handle is at Defocus Media on all platforms. And until next time, be sure to keep it 2020. And we look forward to seeing you on the next episode.